I want to say happy Black History Month. Um, some of our deepest, most profound, prophetic spiritual history is because of the African Americans that God sent to this country. And not all of them felt like they were sent to this country because of the terrible ways that their history was, our history was expressed in itself. But I love that we have a month to celebrate black history because, uh, you know, we have the rest of the year to celebrate everything else because black history wasn't written well into our history. And so we have come together as Americans and let's celebrate the black community and what their contribution was to the world, or not just to America, but to the whole world. And so today, part of my message actually comes from Harriet Tubman's life story, who's one of my spiritual heroes and has been since I was 12 years old. And that's her on the wall right there. You can look at her a couple times, if, unless she's behind you, while I'm preaching, because she's amazing. She's, she truly is one of the greatest heroes of America. And so I'll share in a minute about her. But I just want to uh, thank you so much for uh, who, you who are black, for your ancestors and the price you paid for our nation. And we just, we so respect your heritage, who you are. We believe in you. This is an important month. And so, yes. Now I don't know how to start my message because I'm so happy about black people. Okay. <laughs> if I put on the glasses, I got anointed. Um, so, you know, I'm in this place of believing that there's a new culture for Christianity that's really the same old culture. There's a new expression for Christianity to be, you know, received in our generation. And a lot of this expression will be received best when we love the right way. And when our motivator, our divine motivator as a Christian is truly love again. And I want to kind of break some things down and just kind of start with a question because a lot of times we've been taught this whole concept of calling and promised land and going after a destiny and all these things. But we've been taught out of a performance mentality that we get to do something for God. And because we get to do something for God, that's our goal. And we set that as our object and our goal, whether it's something in the entertainment industry or something in church or something, you know, building a family or whatever it is. And that becomes our such, so much of our goal that sometimes it violates the very principles of love that the gospel is about in the first place. And so instead of asking, what is your promised land? I want to repose a question and say, who is your promised land? Because it's always about the who in the kingdom. It's not about the what. And I'm going to kind of get, lay out a foundation for you, a framework for you to really come into some understanding of how to ask God to give you even more of your who, excuse me, the people you're called to and, and the people that are truly your destiny. And I'm going to define this in a couple different ways, but I want to talk about Harriet Tubman for just a minute because Harriet Tubman was a prophetess. I don't know if you know that. She heard God on such a clear level that not only would she have died if she didn't hear God this way over and over for decades, but everyone who was with her that she saved would die as well. So the first time that she got commissioned from God, she had an encounter with the Lord where he came as a father and he said, I'm going to release you to be like a Moses to your generation. She was a teenager. You're going to bring freedom to black people. You're going to be free yourself. And she was, I mean, she was a little slave girl who had no hope. And she had been hit in the head not too long before that by a slave owner who had abused her because of something that she was trying to get them to stop hurting another slave who was being punished. And he hit her in the head and she was hit, uh, she had a skull fracture and she started bleeding out of her skull. They actually released her two days after the injury to work and she couldn't work well so they were going to sell her to a slave gang but no one would buy her because she was that frail and there was no purpose for her life. In that season she had the visitation where God came to her and said, I'm releasing to be a Moses. During that time, she tried to escape twice with her brother. She got caught both times. Then she realized, I need to spend time with God and figure out how to do this, like his way. And she prayed, and God led her. She escaped a third time, and God led her each step of the way. And you could read this in several biographies where she, he, he said, like, don't go down this path. Go across this river. Like, one of the rivers she went across at one point was so deep and so rushing that people died who had tried to cross so many times. But God said, you can go across right now. And it only came up to her neck the entire time. It was impossible. Like, it doesn't happen that way at this particular river. So there's all these moments in time that this little girl escaped because she heard from God like 11 or 12 times in the first journey all the way up into the land of freedom by herself. Can you imagine one of our teenagers, 15 years old, 14 years old, crossing over into a freedom land. And she goes, God, I don't know anybody here. I have no resources. You're my only friend. What do I do? And she started to get some odd jobs and she started to, you know, have a life for herself. She rented out a little room in a basement of this uh, 
church building and, and lived there for a little while. And during that time, God spoke to her, and, and she, she thought she was doing well for herself because she's free, but God spoke to her and said, what about the others? You're a Moses. What about your family that's still there? So she realized she was going to have to do something. Still as a teenager, she realized she was going to have to do something, and her nieces were um, being sold in Maryland, and she, she knew that if she didn't go to Maryland at that point, she'd never see them again. So she went over to Maryland and snuck them out, and that was the, her first people she snuck out. And she heard God each step of the way so they didn't get caught. Because you have to realize, they knew how to catch these people. The phenomenon that she was is that every trip she made, she wasn't caught. And that she made over 11 journeys. And out of the 11 journeys, not one person was lost. So she had over 100 and something herself and 300 total from her prophetic journeys where she listened to God. And because of her and the Underground Railroad and the whole thing that they established, it set a hope that was a tipping point hope for African Americans in the entire nation. That's why she's going to be on the $20 bill soon, because she deserves to be. And when you, when you use that money, I, want, I just want you to always hold that money in a precious way, even with your children, because it represents hope. It represents, like, she's not going to be on the currency, and currency is one of the things that establishes the government of this land. And she's going she's gonna to be on every single one of those as a prophetess of freedom, a prophetess of daughtership. At one point, her parents confronted her and said, Harriet, we refuse to let you go one more time down south. And she said to her father, she looked at him in the eyes, and she said, I would always listen to you. I'd always respect you. But there's a father that's higher in heaven. This is why she's still a teenager that has spoken to me, and I have to say no to your authority right now. And it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And she went again, even though she was disobeying her natural father. But because she went again, she was able to go again and again and again and again. She was never caught, and she was always a civil rights leader from that point on, whether she wanted to or be or not. But what a voice. What a voice in our generation. Now, here's the thought pattern behind it, is that when she was doing all of this, she had a vision of freedom. But when she attained her own freedom, she realized as a Christian it wasn't enough. As a Christian, it wasn't just about the things she got to get, the freedom she got to get. She needed to have the who, the people she was supposed to bring into that freedom with her, that she didn't just represent the one that got to be freed. She, she represented all who needed to be freed. And so all of a sudden, instead of her, her destiny being to get to freedom, that was just her calling is to help see freedom birth on the earth. But her destiny was the people who were supposed to get there with her. And we constantly violate our true destiny, which is the people we get to love for our sense of performance and calling. And if you think of how ridiculous that is for, for Jesus, Jesus didn't, didn't uh, you know, come to the earth so he can gain a bigger title than he already had. Like in Ephesians 1 where it says he was raised above all positions, titles, all those things, he already had that. He came so he can raise you in that position with him. So he came, you were the, the people he came for. You were the joy set before Jesus and the whole reason why he came to the earth in the first place. And so many times we get this empowerment in the church where we, you know, we, we repent and we accept into our lives and we're like, now I'll change the world with you. And it becomes about changing the world. It doesn't become about being the love of God in the world that is the actual thing that changes the world and actually attaching our heart to people groups. And I think about like when we first moved here, God had spoke to me in 1996. I was going to go to L.A. and he, that it was my land and I'd live and die here. I don't know if I'll ever move, but I don't think I will. And I, I start praying for L.A. from that point on. I start coming out on usually three to five journeys a year, depending on the year. And uh, I only missed one year during that whole time until 2006 when I moved out here. And, or 2007 when I moved out here. And I remember I'd come out here on prayer journeys and I would fall in love. And I, I didn't have this sense of like, you know, the entertainment industry, that studio is going to be ours. It's Christians and that's going to be our thing. And we're going to do all this incredible stuff. I didn't have like, it wasn't missional in the sense that I had to come out and like possess land and conquer enemies and all that. I, I just looked at the people and I was so in love. I remember walking down Hollywood Boulevard and seeing the drug addicts who were the pov impoverished ones, like the homeless. And I'd see the drug addicts who were in their Mercedes doing drug deals on the same, you know, different corners on the same street in Sunset Boulevard. And I'd look at it and go, these are my people. God, I love them. These are the ones I love. And I remember just having a sense that Jesus was so homeless in Los Angeles, that he was so, so homeless in our nation, but so homeless in Los Angeles, and that he wants us to build more of a home for him. But the home is our love and our family and our culture, not just churches. And we didn't really know what to do when we got here, so we began to just house, you know, house a meeting or host a meeting in our house and, 
and Hona and Jennifer and I and a couple other people, we just toasted this meeting, and the first one was closed, but th it was completely full, and we're like, how did you all get here? We don't know who you are. <laughs> we invited like 20 people, and there's like 65. We're like, well, who are the rest of you, you know? And we, we just started having this meeting because ju they just showed up, and people started to ask us for a divine, defined vision, and I remember just saying, we're not there yet. You are my defined vision. I waited my whole life to meet you. Like, I prayed for over 10 years just to meet you, just to fall in love with you. Like, let's, let's just fall in love, and then we'll find a vision. You are the vision. You know, like, you are the joy set before me. That my, my calling is to love you. My calling is the relationship with you. And that was really uncomfortable for some people who wanted to have a huge framework of, like, how are we going to take the city? But I think of Jesus with the disciples and how they were asking for natural position. And he didn't rebuke them, but he did help bring, like, a... Uh, maybe a, not a correction, but a course correction of their heart. And he'd say, you know, get to know my father. He's the one who gives positions out. In other words, he, he repointed them at relationship. It's actually about relationship. You're going to have more authority than you could dream of as a general. You want to be a general in my army? That's awesome. But you, you'll have more authority than even that because I'm seated at the highest position and my joy and my passion and my destiny is to raise you up to be there with me. And if church would operate this way, if we would literally look at our lives and look at those around us and say, you're the joy set before me. I'll pay any price that you come to your fullness. You know, it's like, it's, it's like when you have a family with my daughters when we had our first one, Harper, and I dreamed. I remember holding her in the hospital room the first couple days. I stayed in the hospital with Sheree. And I just looked at her and I was like, I'll move mountains for you. I'm going to make more money for you. I'm going to do everything you need to do everything that's in your passion and your heart. Anything you're called to, whatever I can do to make that easier or possible for you, I will do it. I'm like, just in my heart going, you're mine. And there's, she had no value to me at all other than she's mine. Because she was a big mess. And she made big messes all the time. And I remember just like three months into it going, there's nothing you can do for me. There's no reward in your life right now. Other than when you look at me, I melt. But you know, but I'm willing to give up my life for you as a child. I will throw myself in front of a bus for you. I love you so much. And there's that place as a parent where when, when, when you have this like love for your child, you'll do anything. There's this place Jesus modeled that he had such a love for the world, he would do anything. A lot of us haven't entered into the full passion of what God's called us to because we haven't fallen in love that way yet. We're still trying to do the thing instead of love the people. Therefore, when we're doing the thing and there's failure or when there's, or when there's a different result than we we're expecting or when God's taking us through a different process on purpose because there's a different plan for us than we thought. We get disappointed in the stages of growth because it's still not about the people. We haven't surrounded ourselves with a community of those we get to love, whether they're saved or not. We're surrounding ourselves with the people we get to do things with. It's such a subtle violation of the culture of the kingdom, but it's prominent in the, in the body of Christ in the Western world. Deuteronomy 11, 11. This was a picture of the promised land. It's up here on the screen. It says, but the land you're crossing to the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It's a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from beginning of the year till its end. Sheree and I, when we bought the house and we were pouring, we had to repour a lot of the concrete and foundation. It, it would have been the money pit, but it's a good house. So, um, but we're going to play the money pit at our housewarming party, I think, over and over. <laughs> Tom Hanks, ha, ah, you know. But we, um, we had to re-pour the footing at the, the, the door, like the, the front door. And I opened a Bible, and I poured that into the footing to Deuteronomy 11.11. Because I was like, this is the land that drinks dew from heaven. God promised me this land. But God promised us our house and our land because we knew we were supposed to create a safe place for artisans, for mentoring discipleship, a place to hear from God, an open heaven, so to speak, where people can come and, and, and have an encounter with God. So it's not just for our family, it's for our people. So I was like, God, this isn't just going to drink dew so we can live and dwell here because the American dream is not big enough for God. Just to have security, just to have prosperity is not big enough for God. That's, he never intended us to have that dream. He in, intended us to have a dream that, of course, we will prosper because we love somebody so much he can't help but give us blessing. The promised land was not just about him providing a place for his people to thrive. It was about him providing a place for his people to, to literally have dominion over the earth and his love. The promised land in the New Testament is you and I. It's, we are the joy set before him. We were his promised land. And when you look at this, this is an Old Testament paradigm, but when you read it, you should read it over your people group, not over the thing you get. Like, I'm going to be an author. Yay, I'm writing books. My book right now is a bestseller, literally. Like, my book's coming out on, on the 6th. Barnes & Noble's just made a huge purchase where it's going to be in all the end caps of the religious section. I'm super excited. 
but I'm not motivated by my book being a bestseller. I'm, I'm so excited. Exploring the prophetic devotional is a bestseller this week, as of right now, but I'm not motivated by the bestsellership, right. even though I just did a plug for it. <laughs> I'm motivated, though. I'm glad it's being widely received because it gives me more authority to love well. Yeah. It gives me a higher authority to be able to have a deeper impact on the people I get to love. So I'm not building significance on the fact that, wow, my book's a bestseller now, whatever. You know, I could put a sticker on it. I make more money. I have more significance because I make more money and I have more received. No, I get to love more. And the people of Israel, they were a paradigm. And the Old Testament is a paradigm of a New Testament truth. I'm going to look at another one where the Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon in 1 Kings 10, verse 6. She said to the king, it's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. No, they don't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance, far more than I could have ever imagined. Lucky the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be God, your God, who took such a liking to you and made you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this, making you a king to keep a just order and nurture a God-pleasing people. The Queen of Sheba comes, one of the most pagan queens in the world, one of the most powerful people in the world, one of the richest people in the world, comes because of his reputation for goodness and because of Israel's reputation for blessing and comes and sees it for herself and gets saved and says to Solomon, surely God's real and good and surely he loves his people because he raised up a man like you. I'm, I'm telling you, if, I don't know how I'd put that on my gravestone, but man, if I love that well, that people know that God loved the people I served because of his love for me and because of how I was a leader in that genre. I mean, think about the things you're about to influence. Can you imagine if people look back at your life and go, surely God's real and he loves his people because of you. Surely God is real. I mean, God brought the greatest resources known to a generation to build his temple. And Solomon stewarded it so well that a king from every country or a diplomat from every country came to see what was going on. That's crazy. Now, who is the, the temple or what's the temple in the New Testament? Come on, this is like we teach this in there, you know. <laughs> who is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Will he spare any expense to make you his habitation place? When you are so alive with his love and you're so alive with the gospel truth, something happens. People start to come seek you out and find you. And you display favor and you display prosperity, and you display a difference that people go, I know God's real because the favor that's on your life proves he loves the world. For God so loved the world that he sent you. For God so loved the world. His love is true because the way you love makes me believe there's a loving God because you're so amazing in who you are and what you're doing that God has to be real. Can you imagine that being the report? Maybe it is for some of you already, but I'm telling you, we don't have enough of that report. I mean, Billy Graham has that kind of honorable thing on him where presidents have met with him time and time again, like important people from around the world. They just want to meet with him because he's so honorable, so noble, so good, has so much favor on his life. And all he does when they meet with him is point out his love for Jesus, and he's a loving man to them. His reputation over and over and over is the love. I mean, and he's been raised up to the highest place in Christianity in this generation because he loved well. Not because he's the best evangelist, not because he's the best speaker, not because he has the best marketing team, not because he has the best books, but because he loved people when he had a heart for Jesus to get his inheritance. So what expense would God spare off that? If you have integrity and you have a heart of love, what expense will the Father spare in your lifetime? Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 11, it says, When God, your God, ushers you into the land he promised through your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, you're going to walk into large, bustling cities you didn't build, well-furnished houses you didn't, uh, you, you didn't dig, or build these houses, or dig these wells, or these vineyards of olive orchards you didn't plan, plant. When you take it all in and settle down, please and content, make sure you don't forget how you got there. God brought you out of slavery of Egypt. And I bring this one up because it's a de definition of Old Testament promised land. Now, I would say it this way. In the New Testament, our promised land is literally God's going to bring you into relationships you don't deserve, that you don't, you're not qualified for. He's going to bring you into advisory roles because the Holy Spirit looks like this. Comforter, counselor, advisor, friend. 
and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and your promised land is the people he's calling you to love so Jesus can get his reward. So that means that you're going to be brought into relationships that are beyond your capacity right now, beyond your understanding right now, beyond how you even know how to relate right now, beyond your race right now, beyond your gender right now. He's going to allow you to come into relationships that cause the world to see him in a way that they wouldn't see him if you didn't show up. And he loves doing this. Your promised land is literally the people you get to love. And I, I look at the few empty seats we have here. I know this is a fuller service, so we don't have very many. But we have empty seats here, and I just think of what would happen. Think of the most precious Christian friend, or maybe it's your spouse in your life. And picture you were never introduced to them. And how much would you miss them knowing they could have been there? I mean, think about that. Like, wouldn't that make you so sad if the person you love the most right now was never a Christian and they were never in your life? That would be devastating. But how many of the people that we're going to love the most in life aren't even Christians yet? And they're not even sitting with us in our family unit yet. They're not even connecting to us yet. And there's people who are out there who are going to be your most favorite people in the world that you don't even know yet. But your heart is like intercession. Your life is like intercession, standing between what will be and what is right now. And there's some of the people might be drug-addicted prisoners right now, but they might be your favorite best friend in the whole world. My favorite best friend in the whole world was from Ecuador. And I found him in a loincloth in a village. I'm just kidding. I told my mom that the first Thanksgiving Hona came to live with me. And I was like, Mom, we found him in this, like, village. Out. He was like a little, you know, native kid kind of thing. And, and, he, and Hona's looking at me like, I mean, Hona was, like, definitely middle class Ecuadorian. And so he's, like, like all stylish and, like, great cologne on and, like, you know. And she's like, wow, like, you really cleaned up type attitude. That's funny. But I wouldn't have met most of my closest friends if it wasn't for divine interaction or divine intervention because I chose to set my heart to love a certain way and God brought the people who I would be compatible with and for both their sake and my sake who we could live out this mission of life together in love. So many people get married just for companionship. I would never get married just for companionship. It's not worth it. Get married because you're called to marry the person and you choose to love them. It's a divine assignment because then you'll stay with them. If you're like, I'm lonely, I'm going to get married, get a puppy. You know, get married because your heart is saying, I, I have to express God's love. I have to choose to love somebody. It's part of my inheritance and part of their inheritance. I can't live without somebody in this capacity of my life. And I have something to give them uniquely as a person that's part of my destiny. It's my destiny to love them. That's a way better reason. Jesus prayed in John 17, and he, I need my glasses on so I can see. Okay, there's the time. Jesus prayed in John 17. And he prayed this beautiful prayer where he was, he was proving Hebrews 12 too, where it says, you know, for the joy set before me went to the cross. But he prayed this beautiful prayer where he's praying to the Father, saying, God, Father, I desire those who are with me now and who will be with me, which is us. I desire them to be one, to really be one, to really have that oneness that you and I have, where we know each other's thoughts, where we prefer each other, we love each other so much. I desire them to be that way. And I desire them to know you so much and to know your glory and to see you in your glory. I des- I've sh- shared that glory with them, and they've, the ones that are with me have received it. But as I desire them to go on that journey. of re- And he, basically what he's proving, the only recorded prayer of Jesus where it wasn't to train us, it's still training us, obviously. Very vulnerably, John's rehearsing this prayer and saying, I mean, it's just remo- it's divine, divine motivator of John after this. So he's called himself the apostle of love. Because he sees Jesus who came to the earth to restore you, not just to intimate fellowship with God, but to oneness, like to share the same space at the same time, to love so much. He's like, Jesus is going, this is my destiny. This is why I came. I don't need a natural position. I don't need natural fulfillment. But God, I desire the ones who truly are with me to be with me forever in oneness and to know you the way that I know you. I can't live without that kind of knowledge. He was a desperate, hungry man for his calling to be fulfilled, which was his destiny to be you. We had a young actor who came here for a number of years. He's in um, Vancouver right now. And he, he well, probably about a year because he got a job pretty fast. He, when he was a teenager, it was during the recession of 2008. And uh, he was a really young, like uh, he was 12 or 13. I can't remember, I remember the age. But he, uh, he was in Atlanta with his parents. 
and they both had lost their job. And he said, I've had an encounter with God. He's never said anything like this in his life. This is his first time. I'm supposed to be an actor. We're supposed to move to L.A. And I'm supposed to have like a major show. Or I'm supposed to be on a major show. And I'm, my, my destiny is to act in L.A. And they, they were like, we believe this. Like something inside of them, it wasn't like a kid dream. It was like they believed it in their core. And they were like, we're going to leave everything, take our savings and move to L.A. That's a true L.A. story right there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And <laughs> so they came out here, and, and they were uh, just real busy when they first got out. He had a lot of additions, and he, was, he got commercials right away. And in the first 10 months or so, they made more in the first 10 months managing him than they did in both their careers back in Atlanta. So they were like, this is during a recession. So they were doing really good. And his dream was, like, he kind of saw, like, a Nickelodeon or, or, or Disney-type show, right? And so one day, he um, gets the biggest audition of his life. He's just he, that young kid, you know, gets the biggest audition of his life to be a, a, a primary person on a new, I think, I believe it was a Disney show. And he's so excited about it. His, his mom has this, like, just unction. Just, you know, like an unction is, like, spontaneous. You ask something you wouldn't normally ask. And she goes, why do you think you're supposed to be an actor? Because God told me it's my destiny. It's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be great. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm supposed to minister to people because of this place of authority. And, and he's, like, in. You know, like, he's, like, in his preaching mode of like what he's going to do and what he's doing. And she goes, I don't feel like that's deep enough, but I don't know why I'm asking. I'm not accusing you. I just don't think that's deep enough. Like your answer isn't selling me. I think you need to go pray with God and spend some time with him and ask him why. So he listens to her, goes into his room like right away. He's like, I'm going to go do it right now. And he's gone for hours. They forgot about him until dinner time. They're like, oh, he's gone. <laughs> and they go to find him and he's weeping in his room. He comes out of his room weeping and he's like, I was so wrong. I'm so wrong. I'm so wrong. This story literally has discipled me. And I think I'll disciple you too if you've never heard it. And they go, honey, what's wrong? What's wrong? It's like, nothing is wrong. It's so right. God is so good. He's like, I always thought my destiny was to be an actor. And he goes, but my destiny is to love people in the entertainment industry. God's going to give me authority and my calling as an actor so I can love grips and cameramen and actors and makeup artists. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an audience with them because they don't go to church. They don't go anywhere around where Jesus would be seen. But they're going to see Jesus in me and I'm going to be able to love them in such a unique way. And I've had it wrong, Mom. And because I've had it wrong, I've been in competition to the entertainment industry. I've been in a bad place in my heart. I can't, God can't promote me when it's wrong. But because I'm getting it right right now, I know God's going to promote me. Maybe even tomorrow I'll get the show, but it doesn't matter matter if I get it or not. And she's like, who is my son? <laughs> who is this child? She's like, she's crying because she's like, I thought our destiny was to help you become an actor. Like, I wasn't even in love with all these people that were supposed to come in. I mean, like, she goes in with other, you know, moms, and she's like, I hope your son doesn't win, you know? I hope he doesn't get the part. Like, I'm not going to talk to you too much because it's all posturing, you know, thing. And she realized she'd come into that spirit. She'd come into that place. So they go to the, the audition the next day, and there's that one little boy who ends up being in all the auditions that he is significantly, and every time they're pit against each other, the other kid gets it. So she's like, sees him, but the good thing is he's sick with the flu, so she's like, yes. <laughs> and her son goes, Mom, I have to go pray for him. And she's like, we're at Disney Studios. If you go and pray for him, the director might come out and be like, why are you doing this? What, what's happening? You're weird. Just get out of here. You know? Or the mom might get offended that you're asking it. They might not be Christians or even around our remotely around this. They might think this is really weird and report you or just make it weird for us. Or he might get healed and then he gets apart. <laughs> she goes, I will stand with you in whatever you choose, but I, this isn't the way you have to express your faith on set. Like, like you can do this different ways. You, you can just be love. You don't have to be like, you don't have to bring this kind of prayer onto the set right now. And she just thought he was being zealous because he's so young. He goes, no, mom, I have to do this. So he walks over by himself, like really fast. Like she's just kind of watching him. And he goes, hey, I know this sounds weird, but I'm a Christian. I noticed you're really sick. I just believe God doesn't want you to be sick. Can I pray for you? And they're like, yeah, they don't know anything about this, but he thought it was the sweetest thing ever. He, yeah, the mom's like, this is great. And he puts his hand on the boy, and the mom puts a, his hand on too as if she knows what she's doing. And he <laughs> prays for him. And then right as he finishes praying, uh, they get called in. Not him, but the other kid and his mom get called in. So he doesn't see if there's a result or anything. He gets called in, and he's sitting there, and he's just like smiling, beaming. And, and the, the casting director comes out, and usually they let everyone, most of the time, they, and when it's a small group because they were second pick group, they, invite, they still have them all auditioning before they choose. But uh, at least as far as the, well, that's what the family said for their experience. And, and the casting director comes out and says, hey, to the couple guys who are left, um, we're not going to audition anybody else because we, we really found who we were looking for. And so we're really sorry about that. But, um, you know, you guys are awesome. We love you, oh, whatever, you know. And so he's with his mom, and she looks at him and goes, you realize he just got the role. 
And she goes, how do you feel? And he goes, I fulfilled my destiny. I mean, now he's on that show and he's an actor on a show. He's doing great. But his destiny wasn't to become an actor on a show. That's just the vehicle where he gets to love. And it took a 12-year-old to disciple all of us, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's so simple. And I think of Jesus where his destiny wasn't to become a natural king. And, and everyone was trying to give him kingship. They were trying to get Israel to rise up against Rome. They were trying to, to destroy the current politics in the geopolitical realm. They were trying to, you know, there was so, such severe racism against Jews. Jewish people were so sick of being oppressed. And they'd seen it in the Old Testament time and time again where God sent a judge or a warrior or a king or whatever. And they were waiting for this natural militant, you know, army progression. And he came with a war of love. And it offended the Jewish culture to where they're still an offense towards Jesus today in some of the Jewish culture because they're looking for a natural army. And we have Jesus, who's the man of love, who says, I'll spend any expense it takes to reveal my love. Now, I just think about this, and I think if, if you know who you're supposed to love, God will spare no expense in helping you love them. Like I said about my daughters, like, you know, we had a daughter. We, we weren't sure we should have another one yet because, and we didn't actually try to have it in that time. We were like, let's wait two or three years to have another daughter because let's just build financially again. Like, let's, that's hard having a kid. All of a sudden, you're, there's expenses that I never knew about. I never dreamed about the types of expenses that are in marriage and then a kid. I was like, wait a minute, I have to pay for your hair to get done that many times? I, <laughs> my haircut's 30 bucks. Like, what's going on, you know? Like, you know, there's just expenses that come up. So, all of a sudden we get pregnant, and my, as a father and as a man, my first thing is like financial anxiety. I'm like, huh. And she's looking at me going, this is what we chose, and we, this is what we, we knew God had us choose, so there's blessing in it. Why would you be afraid of having another child? God blesses this. this, is, this he, he told us to do this, to have a family, and it was not in our timing, but he has a timing that's different than ours. Why would you entertain stress and anxiety about this? And I'm like, stop discipling me. I didn't get married to you for that. Sit behind me, woman. <laughs> I say that because if you know Sheree, there's no sitting behind anywhere. <laughs> but there's always more provision. There's always more blessing when you're doing what you're called to do by loving the people you're called to love. As a matter of fact, you'll have radical blessings and favor. You know, there's that prosperity message of the 1950s that took root in the 70s and 80s. It was a self-centered prosperity. God will bless you because you love him. No, 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 no. God has always already blessed you because you love him, and he blesses you in eternity, and you're already a king and a queen. You're going to rule with limitless supplies and beauty. But on the earth, there's a thing called faith. And he blesses those who love, and he releases, like Solomon, influence, favor, blessing, so that he can prove he's God to the people he loves. It's not for us. It's for them. If you get favor, it's not for you. It's not, you shouldn't be like, look what the Lord's done. I'm, like, famous. Some people do that in their hearts. They're like, of course I'm famous. That's what the Lord intended because I'm blessed by God. No, no, no. If you are famous, it's because you're called to love somebody. He's putting fame on you. That's actually a resource and a commodity to draw so many people to his light. And I just look at this. Like some of us, like we don't have a lot of favor or economy or resources or whatever. And a lot of it's linked to the lack of focus on who's your who. Who is your promised land? Because when you... When you focus on your promise, then when you get there, you know you're in it because it gets crazy. <laughs> it's crazy awesome. The enemy comes to you and tries to intimidate you, and then God goes, he's just coming because I'm about to break through. And then the breakthrough is so awesome, and you're like, your breakthrough needs breakthrough. Your miracles need miracles. You're like, this is the most crazy thing that's ever happened. Children of Israel get into the promise land, and they're like, oh, it's a whole other message, but they get into the promise land, and they're like, but there's giants. And he's like, now you need more miracles because we're going to take them all out. There's people occupying the cities. I made those cities mature for you. We're going to drive them out. They're like, oh, my dear Lord Jesus, we thought it was going to be easy. No. You're, when you get into your promise land of the people you're supposed to love, there's so much dependency, like Harriet Tubman, to where if he doesn't give you a navigation system according to his love, you will die. You will go back into a worse place than you started in. But, man, if you can rely on relationship with God for the sake of relationship for others... The world's going to look at you and go, this is different fruit. We can't do this. We can't produce this. We can't manufacture this. We know God's work. Queen of Sheba, the richest woman in the world, most powerful woman of her generation. I cannot manufacture what I'm seeing in your kingdom. 
God is real and I want him. Don't you want your life to produce that? So I want us to stand up. Most of you know who your who are, but if you don't, we're going to pray. Either God gives you your who, they are your promised land, I'm telling you. Jesus is the hope of our calling, but also the hope of our destiny is those we get to love. And so who's our who? And if you already know it, God may redirect you in the midst of it and show you more, give you an expansion. What I love about when you get a revelation from God, he always gives more. He always stretches it open. He always gives you another installment. Like he gives you more installments than Apple does. But you got to wait and let your system update. That's why we come to church. So your operation system can update right now. So we're going to ask for one of those impartations right now. I want you to just close your eyes and put your hand on your heart. And Father, we ask you through the Holy Spirit to reveal our who. Who is our who, God? Who is, who is our promised land? Show us the industry or the family or the nation or the city or cities. It doesn't have to be limited, but Lord, help us to focus on one area. Who is our who? And if we know, Lord, show us something we never knew. Let us fall in love in a deeper measure by, Lord, show us something else you love about them. Lord, give us every resource, every favor, every assignment that we need to get to into their lives and to have the fullness of the promise on manifest by the full love being released. Thank you for calling, God. But if we've, if we've created an altar out of our calling, Lord, we just surrender it right now. Thank you we get to do things for you and with you, but thank you that it's not about that, that it's about love. Readjust us, God. Readjust our personal significance. Adjust our performance issues. Adjust our anxiety issues, God, based on love, not based on performance. Jesus, you're the best model. Thank you that you came to this world. For God so loved the world you came, even though you didn't need to. You already had it all, but you wanted us. Lord, thank you that we already have it all. You've already given it to us through your, through your cross and resurrection, but we get more. We get to love in an uncommon way a joy set before us. I just pray for a prophetic impartation of the joy set before you, that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, would visit you with his love, and that you would know things today you never knew before for yourself, that you would feel things today you've never felt before, that you're, you'd be compelled with a new spiritual hunger for love for a people group that you've never had before. If you've already had it, that would intensify because blessed are the hungry because they'll be filled. Yes. Some of you might have just lost sight of this a little bit on the who. Maybe you're saying, I don't know if I want to do acting anymore. I don't know if I want to start a business anymore because you lost track of the who. You got beat down by the industry and you lost track of the who or whatever. You got beat down by the circumstances, the, the, the renting houses when you can go by in the land you came from or, or not having the, the deeply rooted relationships you thought you would have, the support system you thought you would have when you go into the industry you're trying to pioneer. And the Lord wants to remind you of the who so that you can, so you can build with vision and faith into his love. So it's no longer about doing something and accomplishing something but it's about loving someone and that the, the price is worth it. That Hebrews 11, they, they were people of faith that they didn't even see what they were promised made fully manifest in their lifetime because God had a greater plan that only through in partnership to future generations would they be made complete. And some of you are looking for the goal to be completed versus the love to be made full. And Lord, I pray that we'd have new goals in our hearts. Take performance drivenness off of us. And I do pray, Lord, that all the empty spaces in our life, that you start to give us vision, whether it's a spouse or whether it's children, whether it's best friends, whether it's business partners, whatever it is, Lord, all the empty spaces in our life, writing partners, art partners, whatever it would be, Lord, that you would give us a vision for, to love the ones who are about to fill those spaces, Lord, that some of the greatest relationships that we could have never dreamed or imagined are about to come into our lives that will add to the relationships we already have. God, give us a vision for that. Let us see them, God, in the spirit. Let us love them before they come. Let us be homesick for them even before they're in our home. Lord, I pray that we'd have that kind of intercession where we, we treat things as though they're real because they are. I just bless everyone here on Super Bowl Sunday at Justin Timberlake's concert, God. To just have a great day of community and family. But Lord, remind us of your nature today. In Jesus' name, amen.